God's merciful, most compassionate, we start our last session and may the blessings of God be upon you all. I'd like to welcome you all to the final panel and by first expressing our gratitude to the organizers and the attendees. The title of this panel is Tactical Developments and the Technological Developments uh, Employed in the Field of uh, Operations and as a Battle Field Weapons. This, the beginnings of that go back to um, World War One by the use of uh, submarines, uh, for example, and airplanes. And in World War II, the use of nuclear weapons, which forced Japan to surrender. In modern-day warfare, there are huge developments uh, which have appeared and changed the conventional sense. Warfare was launched in opening new horizons to non-conventional warfare like space warfare and uh, cyber warfare, robot soldiers, drones, etc. All of these new developments uh, now have been uh, the main uh, occupier of uh, attention and research leading to various developments, uh, the performance by regular armies and non-state actors. Warfare nowadays has been developing rapidly, uh, so much so that uh, war theaters now are being uh, controlled and managed from distances and uh, it's, it can also be said that it's difficult to put some projections for the future in view of the rapid developments. We have three papers. The first paper is titled How Car Bombs Became a Battlefield Weapon especially by, of course, non-state actors, militia groups, and terrorist groups. Hugo Kaman will be the presenter of this paper. He's an independent uh, researcher. He will focus on non-state actors. He has uh, uh, many writings, especially on ISIS in this regard. Please, you have 20 minutes. Today I will be talking. Uh, I will be talking about uh, how the car bomb became uh, a battlefield weapon. And, uh, previous research within this area that, uh, is working. Uh, and I will focus on the
until it's not working. Can you try this one until I'm finished? Yeah, okay. So, uh, previous research within this topic about suicide bombings uh, has primarily centered around uh, the people that drive the vehicles and um, their motivations and uh, why they choose to do so. But uh, my angle is a little bit different in that I speak uh, mostly about um, the vehicles themselves and um, how uh, the actors that use these uh, vehicles have um, designed, manufactured, and in the end uh, employed them on the battlefield. So. Uh, Today I'm going to talk specifically about uh, the Islamic State and uh, how this process has developed since 2014. So, um, traditionally speaking, or historically speaking, uh, the most popular type of car bomb has been uh, or the uh, covert car bomb, in that, um, you know, weak actors, they use them uh, all the time uh, in uh, areas in which they don't control any territory, because uh, when you use um, a civilian vehicle which has no modified exterior, you can't see that it's a car bomb and they hide the payload inside the vehicle. It's very easy for them to blend in with civilian traffic uh, inside cities in opposing uh, held territory. And uh, yeah, so that's why it's been the most uh, commonly used. And uh, especially for the Islamic State also. But something very special happened when the Islamic State uh, started capturing territory across Syria and Iraq in 2014. So suddenly they had uh, clear front lines where they could see who controlled what territory. This meant that they could no longer use these uh, covert car bombs. It was uh, highly ineffective because uh, the enemy would see it uh, coming directly. And when they captured all this territory, they were forced to fight more like a state. So less uh, guerrilla warfare and more like a semi-conventional warfare. And this, uh, in turn, uh, made them develop the armored car bomb. So here you see like a basic example where they have a rudimentary armor on the vehicle that is meant to protect it up until the intended point of detonation. And eventually you would have more advanced types of uh, armor on the vehicles, including angled armor, which deflects incoming rifle fire, and uh, the cage armor on the top, which um, is supposed to crush incoming warheads or provide a standoff distance if the warhead detonates. Yeah. So, situational factors such as territorial control determine very much which type of car bomb, or like the covert or the armored ones that groups like IS choose to do, choose to use in a specific area. And this is true not only for IS, but also for other actors such as uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, for example, in Syria. And uh, car bombs are used extensively by these actors since they are very powerful force multipliers in combat. So, uh, and they can allow numerically inferior non-state actors uh, the ability to overrun larger um, contingents. And for example, the Islamic State uh, in the years of 2016 and 2017 alone, together they um, claim to have uh, used around 1,500 of these uh, armored car bombs. But um, yeah, after a while we would start seeing uh, like target specific uh, designs in that they were modifying the designs to be applicable to specific targets. So for example, when they started encountering uh, hardened targets that were very difficult to um, attack, they would uh, use specific designs. So when they captured all this territory, they also captured a lot of armored vehicles. And uh, while a lot of them were reinserted in their like original roles on the battlefield, they had such a huge surplus of them so that uh, a lot of them were overhauled into car bombs. And this uh, was uh, very innovative for them because um, these vehicles usually had a lot of armor, like pre-existing, a lot more than civilian vehicles. So it didn't take that much to make them uh, withstand incoming fire. And they were also tracked, which would uh, allow them to um, yeah, attack uh, targets uh, off-road. At the same time, you would also see, uh, for example, if IS went on the offensive, they all often had uh, heavy equipment such as front end loaders uh, uh, attached to the frontline units. So if uh, they encountered uh, an obstacle like a roadblock or an earth berm or anything, this heavy equipment could make a hole through there to allow for the car bombs to pass through, often striking uh, the opposing forces from angles that they were not expecting to be struck from. And this continued, and uh, eventually you would have uh, car bombs that um, were based on this heavy equipment. So you had very versatile 
um, designs. And these um, were often very dangerous in that they could remove uh, even large uh, concrete blast barriers and uh, strike targets where yeah, the opposing force thought that they were secure. And within the same uh, subtopic of uh, target-specific designs, you also had uh, two-man car bombs. So you would have uh, one driver and one person on the top uh, uh, firing a rifle towards the targets. So they were in essence trying to suppress the targets and thus uh, attempting to make it more uh, a more successful attack and attempting to make the car bomb uh, reach the detonation, uh, the point of detonation. After this, we would also see environment-specific designs. So, for example, in 2016, we suddenly started seeing a lot of uh, car bombs that were identical in design. They had like standardized armor kits and they looked identical and were used across northern Iraq. And interestingly, the armor was painted in the same color as the surroundings that they were used in. So they were used in often desert plains and um, they were painted in the same color to blend in. And we would also see this when the Battle of Mosul started. So uh, when the Battle of Mosul first started, it was uh, mostly fighting around the city on the uh, Nainawa plains of, uh, yeah, surrounding uh, eastern Mosul. And here you would see, again, these uh, desert-colored uh, car bombs. And uh, they were used outside the city. But when the Iraqi army entered the city, they suddenly stopped using that and instead used car bombs that were painted all white. This was interesting because uh, they were clearly t trying to um, mimic the visual characteristics of a civilian vehicle. So when you're fighting inside the city, um, it's often very narrow streets and uh, the soldiers defending the Iraqi army positions, they often don't have a lot of time to react to uh, incoming car bombs. <clears throat> and uh, for example, IS was thus like trying to make it more difficult for like the coalition air force to um, target them by making them look like civilian vehicles. And inside Mosul, this uh, didn't stop with just white vehicles. Um, soon you also had vehicles in all the colors of the rainbow. So there were yellow, green, red, blue colored vehicles. So they were trying to like diversify the number of different designs within that. In Western Mosul, it went even further. So you had, um, on top of the already painted armor, they painted like fake uh, windshields and grills and uh, like tires on top of the armor to make it look even more like a civilian vehicle. But at the same time, it was armored. After the Battle of Mosul, uh, fighting flared up in Raqqa. And you would see that they were using exactly the same type of design in Raqqa that they were using in Mosul which was interesting. And uh, actually, the Islamic State military commander of Raqqa actually confirmed that uh, the, the military advancements in Mosul had been shared with other provinces so that they had made, they had gotten the, like, the blueprints for the designs. But in Raqqa, they also advanced even further by applying the armor to the interior of the vehicles. So they were armored, but the armor was applied on the interior so that it was even more difficult to spot it. And this says a lot about uh, the extent to which uh, the provinces within the self-proclaimed caliphate uh, shared information among the provinces. So, for example, Mosul shared it with Raqqa, and then Raqqa continued sharing it, as we will see soon. After IS lost Raqqa, they continued, uh, or they changed back to using the car bombs that were colored in the same color as the deserts when they were fighting in the central and eastern Syrian deserts. Eventually, they would reach um, the final pocket of control, which um, uh, sits on the northern shores of the Euphrates River, opposite of Al Bukamal near the Iraqi border, which uh, yeah, the Hajim pockets. And here, uh, Islamic State they would innovate again by introducing this design, which uh, featured. IEDs mounted outside on the top of the vehicle. And you can clearly see, like, by the way that they have designed this vehicle, the, the payload itself is um, a lot more dispersed and uh, raced. And, like, they're trying to aim the IEDs forward to the sides in an attempt to channel the energy of the blasts towards the target. However, it's uh, unclear whether this was successful because normally you would need. Uh, a so-called explosively formed penetrator, an EFP, 
for you to channel it uh, in a direction. However, the intent was there at least. So, as for operational developments, uh, I like the, the analogy of um, the car bomb being uh, the poor man's air force, uh, mainly due to the car bomb's ability to uh, deliver a high uh, quantity of explosives to a, a, a target very accurately. And um, going with that analogy, you could say that the drivers of the vehicles are essentially like the guidance chips of the missiles. So in order to increase the success rate of these attacks, IS also had instituted like certain um, yeah, processes that were always carried out before an attack. So the drivers were always uh, briefed on the target and uh, where they should uh, drive, where they should hit. And oftentimes the drivers were not locals, so local fighters would guide them out towards the front line. However, the biggest uh, game changer was uh, the introduction of uh, specific like car bomb support teams. So you had like, um, for example, it started in the Battle of Mosul. Every single car bomb that was uh, sent out towards the target was assigned a uh, support team. And this support team operated a quadcopter drone. So they were filming from above, following the car bomb towards the target, while at the same time, they were in constant radio contact with the driver. So what they could do was uh, they could direct the driver around any threats, and, uh, which would allow for the driver to circumvent any at all Iraqi defenses and strike them from angles that they thought were secure. And this uh, proved a very difficult challenge for um, the Iraqi forces. And if you look at official IS media, you can see that there's more than 130 cases where IS were able to achieve direct hits on uh, the Iraqi army forces. And uh, yeah, this uh, so-called uh, the information sharing between promises is not only limited to Syria and Iraq, and uh, but in recent years uh, these designs have found their way all the way to Nigeria, actually, with the Islamic State West Africa province. So traditionally, in Nigeria, this uh, splinter group from Boko Haram has not used any armored car bombs, but as we saw in 2018, suddenly they had upper armored car bombs that were of the same quality as. Uh, designs that were used in Syria and Iraq, which was very surprising. And uh, it didn't stop there, as uh, next year they would advance even more, using very specific uh, advanced designs. So like here you have pickup trucks, but the way the armor is applied is very like, well done, in that it doesn't disturb the general profile of the vehicle, which makes it more difficult to spot it as an upper armored car bomb. And also, a very interesting practice can be seen here. So, for example, the side doors here on the side, they're actually taken from a captured armored vehicle that the Nigerian army operates. So this process of uh, like transplanting parts of captured vehicles originates from Iraq and has only been used there before. Here you can see one example where a door from a Humvee was attached to one of the car bombs there. And uh, this uh, process of uh, advanced car bombs appearing in Nigeria is very worrying because um, using these advanced Okay, and the use of these uh, advanced car bomb designs uh, is very worrying because uh, it might help them um, capture more territory and uh, potentially in the future could assist them in, uh, or in the IS core territories in recapturing a lot of uh, territory. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, car bombs are incredibly powerful, versatile and adaptable weapons. And uh, situational factors such as uh, territorial control determine whether IS and other actors use covert or up-armored car bombs. Furthermore, IS have researched uh, and field tested a variety of different uh, up-armored designs, each specific to certain targets and environments. Changes in operational surroundings uh, also spur these changes, uh, and we have different uh, splinter like sub-designs coming on. And like I said before, you can make the analogy that uh, the car bomb is the poor man's air force in that uh, it's the only way that non-state actors are able to counter the incredible like, uh, air, like firepower supremacy that state actors have when they use air forces. And um, as well, the intentional spreading of information uh, to satellite promises is uh, 
risks empowering them and uh, maybe facilitate a return of uh, IS in their core territories. And uh, thank you. That was my presentation. I would like uh, uh, to thank the gentleman who talked about car bombs and will move to the drones now whereby drones have been used extensively and uh, it has become uh, a milestone in the wars uh, Mr. Dan Gittinger will be uh, talking to us uh, about uh, uh, this issue. He is the gentleman's floor is yours. Twenty minutes. This is not going to be from your part of time, so take your time, don't worry. Okay. All right, thank you so much for the invitation, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as I was introduced, my name is Dan Gittinger. I'm the co-director of the Center for the Study of the Drone, uh, which, which is a research and educational ed institution at Bard College in New York State. Uh, we study issues related to unmanned systems uh, in the air, ground, and sea uh, in the civilian and military contexts. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the ISIS and non-state actor, other non-state actor drone programs and sort of the legacy and parallel trends that's happening uh, that have happened since their heyday. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, Center for the Study of the Drone, um, our interest in this issue really began a couple years ago uh, and it's within the context of our, our research into uh, drone proliferation. Uh, so we recently published uh, the drone data book uh, a couple months ago. Uh, which catalogs military, uh, state military um, drone inventories, infrastructure, units, personnel, uh, R&D programs. Um, so we were introduced to this issue a couple years ago, and, and it's been of in great interest to us since then. So I'm going to briefly go over the ISIS drone program and then, again, talk about a few trends. Uh, I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly because I want to leave it open, as much time open for uh, question and answer as possible. So a little bit of background. Uh, the first known drone program uh, that we know of, of a um, uh, non-state actor or, or uh, insurgent or terrorist group was um, in Japan, actually. Uh, this uh, group experimented with remote control helicopters. And it didn't go very far. The helicopters actually crashed. But um, uh, since then, many other actors have, it, have it, uh, tried to adapt this technology, use this technology for their own purposes. and. Um, this has been, been, been made possible recently by the increasing affordability of drone components, of drone systems, and the increasing access of these systems to, um, to uh, regular people like us and to non-state actors. So for the ISIS uh, drone program, we see three basic types of drones. Uh, consumer drones, which are basically ready to fly out of the box. Um, you're probably all familiar with these. They're the DJI Phantoms, the Mavics, the Inspires. Uh, mostly Chinese-made systems. Um, these, they don't require any adaptation uh, in order to be able to fly, although it, they are adapted for uh, kinetic or offensive action. And then we see hybrid uh, systems, which are usually aircraft which are purchased. The airframe is purchased, and then the components are purchased separately. Uh, so a uh, common one of these is the um, Skywalker X8, which you see pictured in the middle. Uh, the Skywalker, uh, you can, it's very popular uh, remote control aircraft in the United States and around the world. Uh, it's very, it was very popular among ISIS and among other non-state actors. Um, basically, again, you know, the airframe is purchased and then uh, it's a, the components are purchased separately. And then the third type that we've seen ISIS, that we saw ISIS use is, are these custom UAVs that we don't recognize. Uh, they appear to be homemade, um, but um, they're usually made out of, uh, out, of, um, out of wood and out of other materials. And it's, yeah, it's, again, it's a little harder to identify these, but they're also quite common. 
So among the common types of drones that we see are the Sky Hunter, the Skywalker I already mentioned, uh, the Phantom, the Mavic, uh, the Talon. Um, these are purchased uh, overseas. From what we know of their supply chain, it's, it's actually quite complex. Um, it, required, it involved multiple suppliers from multiple countries. Uh, sometimes the drone would be purchased in one country and activated in another country before it was actually sent to uh, Syria. And so um, they, ISIS relied on a number of suppliers. Um, ISIS is unique among non-state actors that have drone programs in that they do not have, of course, a foreign state supplier. Uh, so you look at the Houthis the, or the, uh, the Russian separatists in Ukraine, uh, they have a mix of commercial drones and, and state supply drones. ISIS relied, of course, entirely on uh, commercial drones or off-the-shelf drones um, for its program, or homemade drones. In terms of the munitions, it's a very uh, simple munition. Um, it's basically a, a grenade, adapted from a grenade, grenade munition, 40 millimeter. Um, it's, this is the type of munition that we've seen pretty frequently in, in, uh, uh, used by ISIS. Um, it's actually also used for other types of um, um, pr projectiles, like a rifle-based projectile. So all of the um, ISIS uh, drones that carried munitions were modified, basically, to be able to carry them. And of course, none of them came equipped to be able to carry munition. Uh, so we see a very common modification to a DJI Phantom being the small uh, canister that's designed to hold the munition in place so it doesn't uh, rock or, or move while in, in transit. Um, and then basically there's a very common, a very simple servo that connects the munition to um, the aircraft and that enables the operator to release the uh, munition remotely. Uh, so in terms of the night types of ISIS missions that we saw, um, initially we saw propaganda, m messaging. These are not exclusive to each other. Of course, the drone program was essential to ISIS's propaganda mission. Um, but uh, messaging was a major component, major mission set of uh, the ISIS program. Uh, intelligence gathering, ISR. Um, so we saw, as uh, Hugo demonstrated, that drones were essential to helping uh, plan some of these other attacks. And so we see from the photo there um, that, you know, this footage is being used to brief other personnel on, on, uh, on an attack. Um, and then target ID, again, Hugo touched on this earlier, but identifying and guiding uh, VBIDs and other targets to other um, attack mechanisms to the target um, was another essential mission for drones. Uh, direct attacks, so when a drone directly drops a munition on a target, and then we didn't see this so often in, among the ISIS drone program, but a coordinated attack from multiple types of drones or from uh, drones from multiple directions. Um, again, this was not so common that we saw ISIS do this, but we've seen that happen since then more frequently on Russia's air base in Syria and on, uh, on targets in Yemen. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later. In terms of those targets that we commonly see that uh, ISIS attacked were entrenched positions, mobile units, and uh, fixed high-value targets. Um, the ISIS drone program was, in, th in practice, very simple. Um, you know, they really just tried to adapt simple commercial off-the-shelf drones for military uses. And so in that way, it was um, very simple uh, concepts, but it required a bureaucracy and, an, and um, you know, op operational experience to implement. So uh, in terms of some of the um, legacy and uh, parallel trends of the ISIS drone program, so we see the proliferation of tactics and uh, techniques and systems that I ISIS used to other actors. Uh, we see a burgeoning marketplace for counter drone systems, uh, the adoption of consumer drones by state actors and, and, um, and other actors and the growing numbers of recoverable small arm drones. So none of these are, of course, directly born out of the ISIS drone program, but um, they, you know, they're related to um, the experience that ISIS had in, or demonstrated in, in Syria. So in terms of proliferation, uh, we see small arm drones and, and other types of drones being used in Colombia and Mexico, Venezuela, uh, Yemen, Philippines, Ukraine, Afghanistan, as you see here. Um, of course, some notable events that have happened since uh, the ISIS uh, 
drum, the heyday of the ISIS drone program in Mosul was, of course, the attack on, or the attempted attack on uh, President Maduro in Venezuela, and, of course, the attack on uh, Abkayak uh, in, in, um, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a great concern in the U.S. that these tactics are being, um, that this, they'll be used in, in a domestic situation. Um, so, and then another trend that we see, another legacy of the ISIS drone program is the explosion in the market of counter drone systems. Uh, we recently published a report on this and that detailed over 500 counter drone systems uh, currently on the market. Um, we see different types of systems being used for detection and for interdiction of different types of drones. And so a lot of this was born directly out of the experience of the U.S. Army and of the U.S. Army partners in, uh, in Mosul, uh, where there was such a proliferation of small drones and not many ways of combating them. And then another trend that we see is, uh, again, working off of this ISIS experience of u adapting consumer drones for military use is this growth in the market and demand for personal drones for state actors. Um, so we see a growing use of Chinese-made consumer drones among state militaries and state actors. Um, we also see uh, efforts by the U.S. and other countries to develop their own consumer drones. And this is really part of a larger trend that we see in our demand for, again, yeah, this idea that, you know, the military has had these small drones for a long time, but can we adapt consumer drone technology for military use and make it affordable um, so that we can replicate some of the successes that the consumer drone industry has had in the civilian space? Uh, and then finally, uh, we see um, a growing number of small armed systems. And again, this isn't a direct um, uh, you know, result of the ISIS drone program, but we've seen recently a uh, number of these small armed uh, drone or systems becoming, um, you know, marketed to around the world. Uh, so we see a British system here in the top left corner. Uh, in the middle, we have a Turkish system, an Iranian system, a Chinese system, and a system from Belarus. Um, most of these are equipped with um, unguided munitions or light machine guns. Uh, but again, it's it's sort of part of this legacy of, uh, of the ISIS drone program in that there's an effort to adapt um, small rotary wing drones for uh, armed missions. So that's all the slides I have. I look forward to uh, your questions and, and the uh, conversation afterwards. حول الطائرات المسيرة ومستقبلها والتي أصبحت مهمة رئيسية وننتقل الآن إلى المدار الثالث في هذه الجلسة وهو حالات الهجمات الإلكترونية الأشهر في الدول والمجموعات المنظمة حيث مفهوم الأمن السيطراني ومن المؤكد أن هذا المصطلح وبدون إسهاب في التعبيرات التقنية لم يرفع على سطح المشهد العالمي إلى بعد نهاية الحرب العالمية الثانية في خمسة حقوق تقريبا ولم تتضح إثارة إلا ما في داعي في القرن الحادي والعشرين حيث أضحت شبكات التواصل الإلكتروني في أيام يكون تحكم في الدفع this phenomenon has gained more phenomenons and more prominence. And our speaker is Dr. Mohammed Al-Durani. He is from the Qatar Community College. He is the chair of Information Technology Department of the college. And he has many publications to his name. And uh, you have 20 minutes, Dr. Al-Durani. السلام عليكم أردت أن أتحدث بالإنجليزية لكن لأنني في هذا المكان سأحاول إلقاء المحاضرة باللغة العربية لذا الرجاء من المتحدثين بالإنجليزية استخدام سماعات الترجمة بسبب الطبيعة التقنية وأن أشعر بارتياح أكثر في 
في التحدي بالانجليزيه لكنني سابذل جهدي للحديث بالعربيه وامل ان انجح في ذلك It's difficult to change the switch. This subject is very important and very sensitive. It's different than the previous themes we have discussed. The reason for that is uh, advanced countries, you call them militias, we call them criminal groups which have uh, gained uh, know-how in the field of technology to the extent that they have reached the level of countries themselves and the countries and states are using these groups to achieve the same military objectives that you've been hearing, up, uh, hearing about uh, Without firing a rocket or a missile or a bullet, I have 10 examples, but I'll have no time to go through them because I have 20 minutes. I only have time to mention two or three. And there are slides I'll go through quickly because some I'll skip, especially when it comes to some information which are basic and you have to know, like in 2018, so far as cyber security products and services are concerned, like uh, product services, uh, consultations, etc., prior to 2018, reached uh, 77 billion. It's estimated that in 2020 they will reach 170 billion. These figures can change. In fact, they have changed. The United States government is at least on the spot spends 100 billion on cybersecurity. I watched an interview with Macron, the French president, that Half of his defense budget, his country's defense budget, will go on cyber security. This means the development in this field is huge. This means achieving the same military objectives without firing weapons. When we talk about cost, cyber attacks are costing businesses between 400 to 500 billion each year. Maybe these estimates are conservative compared to reality. We have two groups which can reach, uh, uh, achieve the stage of uh, achieving military objectives through uh, cyber crimes. They are nation states and we call them organized criminals. Why we call them nation states? Because they, they are employed by, because major countries do not want to bear the responsibility, so they employ groups either, maybe they are paid by governments, but they are independent in, when, in their organization and operations. There are criminal organizations who, of course, after money and who pays more, gets more out of them. Akbar Mithal, Wahwa Laham, Wahwa Mawjood, you could have a tariq because this case shows you how the state uh, uh, managed to destroy uh, nuclear reactors in Nanta's nuclear plant in Iran. This case was the uh, uh, first time it was published in Washington Post and New York Post with the details which were not known. More cyber attacks before, unfortunately, are not published because countries do not want to, to uh, expose themselves by publishing details except for this case and through my uh, research, I think it's, there was even a film made about this called Zero Day. It started in 2009, 
but the impact of the attack was published in 2010. The, vi the virus or one was called stagnant, so managed to destroy 60% of the plant, which was very close to produce to, uh, or the enrichment of the uranium uh, almost reached the level to enable the Iranians to have a nuclear weapon. Maybe they have one already, we don't know, but uh, Nanta's nuclear plant is offline. Uh, it's not online, there is no internet. The way the virus was there are, in fact, uh, four uh, uh, holes or gaps found by uh, in Microsoft, uh, all, the, uh, all the different operating systems which reach now Windows 7 or 10, now I don't know. When the plant is offline, it means that there is no connection with the outside world. Maybe it's underground, maybe it's in the middle of the desert. This is this is the plant which was dealing with the enrichment of uh, uranium. So it was difficult for Israel and America. This was done in the during the Obama era, or Operation Olympics, or something, which started in the days of George Bush and developed uh, in the days of uh, uh, Bush. Then it was launched in the days of Obama. Israel was uh, pressurizing America to use its air force to blow up the nuclear plant. But of course, blowing up a nuclear plant will not impact Iran only, but the rest of the Gulf area. So they had to find a way to destroy this nuclear plant without resorting to exploding it or blowing it up. The virus or the worm itself is in fact made up for they are not present in the possession of any country in the world only for one country because uh, Microsoft made the reverse engineering and discovered four gaps and Israel helped them of course according to these articles the two countries which are concerned with uh, destroying this plant are Israel and America. This is what's been reported in New York Times and, and other publications. As to how they managed to uh, make this, this worm or virus get into the plant and into the grid into the, uh, of the plant, I think this is a picture of Ahmed Najati visiting the plant. Well, and there is another picture when he was standing over a computer terminal. This computer was in the Anybody who, who watches this film will know immediately what kind of operating system, whether it's Microsoft, Windows or nothing. They immediately discovered that. Maybe they knew before, we don't know. The visit was not necessary, it was all propaganda, but the, it's exposed a lot about the, the Iranians and taught. The code is very simple. It's, half a gigabyte and I act just to show you that there is no need to launch aircraft or missiles to destroy a nuclear plant. These four gaps one is to change the speed, the spinning of the enrichment process. Like when you when you're driving a car and you put it on cruise control to do 80 kilometers per hour. But the car actually is moving with a speed of 
120. What you see on the meter is 80 kilometer, but uh, the car is going at the speed of 120 kilometer. There is a big risk of the engine blowing up or something. And uh, this uh, uh, the, uh, the, the virus made the uranium enriching cylinders to spin at 135 kilometers, where it should be 35. But it will be able to reach the point there is no explosion, just the burning. The second worm or virus makes the operators who are watching the screens see everything as normal and green, nothing red on the screens. So therefore they think that everything is going according to plan. The third worm sends all the information of what's happening to a source outside the plant, to two countries, Malaysia and Denmark, where the manual center of operations, manual control there was watching what was happening inside the plant. The fourth and final virus is related to 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 move to send information through a track or satellite source or microwave. Four viruses or worms destroyed sixty percent of the nuclear plant without sending an aircraft or launching a missile. Maybe their project now to produce a nuclear device by Iran was delayed for many years. Some people say that uh, some Iranian scientists who were working inside the plant were arrested. We don't know. This is what we are talking ولكن الفيروس المستخدم did the same thing similarly to what happened with Iran they did with Aramco they say it's a version of مشابه ولكنه يسبب مشكلات أخرى هو لا يدمر إلى نقطة التدمير ولكن يعرقل for spying so they did two things, Tadmir and Tajassus. For Rasgas and Aramco in Saudi Arabia, the attack took place in 2014, and last year they, and, uh, they didn't know what to ha was, was happening. Suddenly, in Rasgas, 30,000 devices stopped working. Nobody knew what was happening. Luckily, they have upstream and downstream operations. Upstream, Ras Lafan, where extraction and downstream in the operations, marketing, sales. And there was a plan to link the network from downstream to upstream, which means that if this SAP company was late in doing this, then you can imagine we'll have a problem with gas, or maybe uh, the entire operation will be brought into a halt, and this will impact the revenues of the country. Luckily, what happened in the downstreams and the operations, and the virus wiped out everything after it had done its job. What was its job? Sniffing uh, an entire network, taking screenshots, whatever you type on the screen, there will be a shot taken of it. Recording audio conversation. Uh, even the keyboards, uh, the key logging information. يشفروها وثم ينقلوها إلى الطرف الآخر كيف حدث ذلك كيف حلوها 
30,000 uh, jihaz, even if you reformat it, you can solve it. This, uh, they went back to the age of using pen and paper for some period. Um, Aramco and Rust gas, by the way, here, la ta'lu juhdan wa la malan, they spend money as they like. Aramco's budget is more than $100 billion invested in technology. Uh, uh, ten years ago, I met with Aramco. He had $500 million for IT purposes only. You can imagine now. DDoS stops certain services, but they come back quickly. هذا مهم جدا المشكلة أنه لا نعرف القنابل الموقوتة بإمكانك أن تفجر أي شيء لكنك تفجرها في الوقت المناسب الآن between nations مع الدول بعضها البعض هم يزرعون these worms related to the infrastructure بإمكانهم أن يوقفوا مصانع توليد الكهرباء والماء إذا ما أرادوا thankfully in the because of the blockade I say thank God thank God the neighboring countries did not do anything by way of uh, cyber attack لكن أن يهدم بنيتنا التحتية هذا كان سيكون كارثة because one of the countries blockading countries have very high capabilities and I'm talking about the UAE the UAE has reached a stage whereby they acquired cyber capabilities to send worms to any country to stop their infrastructure. Imagine if you wake up in the morning to find that there is no electricity supplies or electric supplies or all the traffic signals have stopped. This can be a big problem and now America, Russia and China whom uh, they planted their time bombs which can do that and it happened in America, in Illinois, in Turkey, in the Ukraine. كنت أتحدث إلى السيدة من الأوكرانيا وقالت لي أن الروس كانوا قادرين على وقف عمل النظام الإلكتروني إستونيا تماما بالكامل and if you remember إستونيا is similar to as إستونيا كانت مرتبطة بالإنترنت كانوا يفتخرون بذلك they were priding themselves that 99% internet penetration in their country we are in country doing here in this country doing the same when they had the problem between them and Russia Russia stopped internet service to the extent that people could not go and receive their money from the ATM machines because the banking system shut down the final example Maybe it's important. وقررت أن أستخدم هذه القضية لأنها مهمة. What happened so far as the Qatar news agency is concerned? You know the entire story. Was a lot published about it, and the Ministry of the Interior talked about it. This is very important for us as Qataris and people who live in this country, because the blockading countries used the hacking operation as a pretext. The video was so fabricated that uh, uh, they had Hollywood style capabilities and they produced this video which was totally fabricated. The FBI and Interpol uh, concluded that it was fabricated but how they managed to hack the system this was done by countries or groups working with countries. So you can imagine you can blockade an entire country from the land, the sea, the air, but استخدم الهجوم السبراني كذريعة. First of all, I'd say المستقبل مخيف.
ومرعب وطبعا نحن we are approaching the World Cup final countries should نحن لسنا فقط نستخدم قدرات دفاعية لأن الفنجان بالدفاع بإمكانك أن تمتلك دفاع but you have to think offensive لأنك يجب أن تطبق القدرات because when we reach this stage the other countries will take us into account هذا سيناريو مرعب ونأمل ولدي تسعة سيناريوهات أخرى لكنني لن أتحدث عنها بسبب ضيق الوقت Thank you very much أنا متأكد أن لديكم أسئلة I hope that my Arabic language is Thank you Dr. Mohamed for your intervention We'll open the floor for uh, receiving some uh, uh, questions. Uh, please uh, be uh, succinct and uh, please address your question to a particular uh, person. My question is to uh, uh, Dr. Dorani. Usually when uh, countries uh, try to combat uh, cyber crimes there would be an agency responsible for this perhaps the Ministry of uh, uh, Defense uh, sometimes uh, uh, the communication related companies do you uh, uh, or can you assess the experiences of the other countries in order to understand uh, this matter and uh, was Qatar successful in having into place a cyber security infrastructure or framework just we will take a few questions and then we can, you can answer hello my question is to dr muhammad durani you said that uh, 30,000 computers uh, were uh, hacked and uh, they resorted to the pen and paper. It is a traditional kind of uh, method, but uh, what if some departments uh, depended indeed on uh, uh, pens and papers uh, rather than uh, computing in order to avoid viruses or avoid uh, cyber uh, intrusions or violations. Thank you. Thank you. My question is Dr. Mohammed as well. As far as tax net, was it uh, to do with uh, human intelligence? Because the site was offline, so how did it end up being harmful? When it comes uh, to the uh, Dr. Dan, when it comes to drones, some drones uh, might be uh, downed by using counter drone. Uh, arms. What if uh, the drones uh, had certain uh, capabilities whereby it could avoid the uh, counter drones uh, arms? Would it be possible for it to be saved? My question is Dr. Mohammed Dorani. As far as the worms are concerned, how do they end up in Iran? Uh, as long as you uh, say that uh, they are under the ground or in the midst of the desert. Thank you. My question is Dr. Mohammed because uh, uh, his subject is uh, uh, interesting as if uh, we are sitting in a, a police kind of uh, setting. We do understand that uh, uh, the United States of America is watching everything like a hawk. Uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, 
Were it possible for any country to move freely away from the United States of America's uh, surveillance capabilities? My question is to Dr. Mr. Dan. When it comes to the uh, new uh, warfare, have we uh, encountered any victory using the drones? Uh, in Tripoli, for example, the drone's effectiveness uh, is to do with assassinating one, two, or three persons, but uh, it cannot be used uh, to invade a certain uh, geography or a city. Could you repeat the first question, please? The question is to do with the site, yeah, the Iranian site. Is the uh, most probable uh, uh, option, as you know, the USB, the flash, the USB that you uh, put in your computer, perhaps one of those who worked in the plant have, have taken the USB, perhaps, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, polluted it and uh, this is the most likely option you can program the USB and you can auto run it that means when you put it in the computer it can download the uh, viruses uh, uh, automatically bef b b without instructing the USB to do so so this is the most likely scenario that's why the Iranians and the officials uh, wanted to clarify this matter because it was impossible. I think it was an insider job. They wanted to know the spies and the agents uh, who worked for foreign countries. Uh, some scholars disappeared indeed. Second question. It's about the blockade and uh, whether Qatar has learned a lesson and uh, had a cyber security infrastructure. As far as the World Cup is concerned, uh, God forbid if there is a cyber attack and uh, the uh, services uh, were disrupted. Can we go back to pen and paper? Why not? But there's also, there's always a backup system we can restore all the information. But the problem is that the backup system, the virus itself or the worm, might affect or attack the backup system. We have the uh, a trend to turn everything into becoming e-service. Uh, even the medical records uh, have been electronized, uh, digitalized. So digitization is going on. Oh, one crime is a ransom virus uh, and it disrupted 43 hospitals in England. Operations stopped and the patients were sent home because they couldn't retrieve the medical uh, records. So this was a ransom kind of virus. There was another virus, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, capable uh, shipment company stopped working. Some vessels stopped across the seas and they didn't know whether to carry on or come back to their own countries. That was the level of disruption. But the backup system is very important uh, as you have a backup to your phone, to your laptop, uh, uh, you need to have a, a backup system. Thank you. Dan? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll take the first one on, um, on counter-drone capabilities. Um, so um, there, there were some reports that uh, IS, ISIS was using um, sort of adaptations to drones to avoid jamming systems, which I think is what you're referring to when a jamming system interrupts the communications between the operator and the drone. 
And so um, there were some reports that ISIS was maybe using tinfoil or other types of adaptations to, to conceal the drone from uh, these, these jamming systems. I'm not sure that worked, um, uh, but, uh, but ISIS did not, you know, at that time there weren't many counter drone systems being fielded in, in Mosul or, or elsewhere. Um, and, you know, there's also a concern from a domestic security standpoint that if one um, intercepts the communications between the drone and the operator, that will force the drone to go back to where the operator, where it took off from, uh, which may be the intended target. Uh, so that is another consideration uh, for, for, an attack, for an attacker. If they anticipate that their drone will be jammed, then they'll just plan to have the target be the place where they took off. Um, so that could be another way that uh, bad actors get around counter drone systems, or jamming to at least. Um, a lot of counter drone systems don't involve jamming, they involve kinetic mechanisms, um, nets, uh, offensive weapons. Um, but those are a couple of ways that I can imagine an actor avoiding a counter drone uh, attempt. Um, in terms of the victory, of drones, um, uh, you know, I think drones largely have been used uh, for as a tactical weapon. Um, so we see, you know, in, in by ISIS and by other by the United States and by by most actors, you know, drones have been used to achieve small tactical victories. Of course, the U.S. had a long campaign of assassination using drones, and so that's you know that's part of the legacy of 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 the drone of of drone weapons. Um, so it's, it's not so common to see drones being used uh, to achieve a, a strategic, I think, effect that, one, that, um, that you might, I think you were referring to. I think the um, one exception, I mean, you know, in terms of non-state actors, what we've been seeing by the Houthis to attack critical infrastructure um, may be, you know, something that, you know, is an example of a way that they could use a drone for a strategic outcome. Um, but you know the the proliferation of drones hasn't hasn't really changed. Uh, obviously, it's changed the situation on the ground in, in places like Tripoli, but it hasn't you know yielded strategic differences um, that might otherwise not be the case. Thank you. If you want to add anything, sir. Uh, Lastly, and before we uh, uh, finish uh, this. Uh, Session, I'd like to say that technology is a double-edged sword. It has changed the world towards peace, but it encountered the number of challenges that we'll be facing in the future decades. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for their interventions uh, and uh, splendid uh, papers. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like also to thank uh, uh, the, those in charge of this uh, conference and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies uh, uh, for allowing us to keep the pace uh, with uh, 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 what goes on in our world. Thank you and peace be upon you. I would like uh, to thank you, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Rashid Naimi. I would like uh, to thank you. I just, uh, uh, a quick concluding remarks, uh, and it is fourfold. I would like first to thank the Arab Center for Research and Policy Study. I would like to thank uh, Azbi Bushara, uh, the General Director of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. I would like to thank all the volunteers. I would like to thank all those who were uh, in charge of this conference. This conference is the first step in the door. It is the beginning. And uh, as you have witnessed in this session and in the previous six sessions, we touched upon a number of uh, issues, uh, the transformations of militias, uh, the performance of the militants, uh, the geography, the impacts, and so on and so forth. And these are convoluted kind of issues uh, that ought to be uh, understood. Uh, hopefully, we will expand uh, our efforts in 2021 we'll be having a policy uh, report whereby we would 
uh, skeletonize uh, everything that has been said and we'll be submitting also recommendations. Uh, we'll, also, we'll also be putting into place uh, a peer-reviewed book uh, that deals uh, with uh, the non-state actors uh, as well as another book perhaps that will focus on uh, the transformation of militias into becoming armies or the other way around. And those who want uh, further information, uh, we would like uh, to uh, call upon you to uh, expand uh, on these kind of issues, uh, especially when it comes to uh, cyber security, uh, illustrated by Mohammed Al Dorani. And lastly, I uh, wanted to talk about the future uh, conferences of this uh, center. Uh, there is the conference on national security and the regional security that will be uh, held uh, this year. I'll stop here, perhaps. I'd like to thank you again. This is the end of our conference. Uh, very good day to you all.